Good morning. This is May 22nd in the year 2000 here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is the part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we have with us Wilbur Sanford. Good morning, Wilbur. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And you? I'm fine, thank you. And before we get further into this, I understand people call you Sandy. So That's from right. here on in, I will call you Sandy. Very good. May I ask your age? I'm 89 until July. <laughs> <laughs> and then something happens, right? Then I have another birthday. <laughs> okay. And what is your address, sir? You in Natick. And your current marital status? I'm married for be 66 years in July and September. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you same have, woman. Do you have same woman? <laughs> do you have children? No children. Okay. Where were you born, Sandy? Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio, and raised out there. Up until now, I'm still in the process of being raised. I think. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you leave Columbus, Ohio? Well, we left Columbus for New Jersey in 1924. And then uh, I lived in Connecticut a while, and uh, then af after the war, I was tra uh, transferred from West Electric up to Boston shop. And we've been here now since 1936. Into Natick in 1936. No, I came to Natick in 1950. Oh, it, oh came I'm to sorry. Massachusetts in 36. Okay. So there was an interim step, but let's take it one at a time here. Mm -hmm. um, you moved to New Jersey uh, from Ohio. That's right. What part of New Jersey were you in? Well, it was at Kearney, New Jersey for, uh, for, for the first year, and then we moved up to Connecticut, which is where my grandparents, maternal grandparents lived. And was it uh, from Connecticut that you went into the military service? No, I actually uh, was from, uh, from Watertown in Mass. Okay. And uh, from Maine, well, my wife is from Maine, and uh, we were living up there for a few weeks before I actually went to the re reception center. Okay, L let's get you into Watertown then. Um, is it from Watertown that you went into service? That's right, that's okay. why I enlisted. <laughs> okay. What was uh, that community like when you moved to it? What was what? What was, that, uh, what was Watertown like when you moved to it? Well, it's very much like it is today. I, uh, at that time, uh, was I started to go back to uh, Western Electric in New York, and uh, they needed me needed help up here more than they did there. So they transferred me up to our Boston, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, distribution center. Okay, um, you you were working for Western Electric, is that correct? That's right, uh -huh. and. Tell us about the work, the, the type of work that you did there. Well, I uh, was involved in repairing switchboards and, and telephone component equipment like relays and uh, all, almost all products that are connected with the telephone communication system. So you were in, in, a, in a sense in communications. Yeah. Uh, approximately what year was that? Well, I came up here in uh, 1936. And the work that you did, was was this in a big factory, or can well, you describe where you it's worked? It's a big building, and uh, we had, uh, I worked on a, a floor where switchboards and that sort of equipment were repaired. How about preparation for a job like that? Did you go to school and learn these skills, or did they teach well, you these I things? I had, had studied uh, principles of electricity, and uh, when I left there, they uh, were able to utilize my experience in education and kept me at Fort Monmouth for two years teaching principle of electricity. Oh, I, I haven't got you in the service yet, but... Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, let's get a date on this. When did you enter the service? Uh, September 42. 
September of 42. So you had been working at this other place six years at least, yeah. uh, getting all this equipment uh, background. Mm -hmm. Did you, specifically, did you make the machines or did you the, do the engineering processing? No, I wasn't in engineering until I got out of the service. Okay. But when you were working in the plant, you were learning uh, the, technician. the, the uh -huh. technicians, all right. When, can you tell us about your family background, your mother, your father? Well, my mother is uh, out of Nantucket stock, and my father's ancestors settled in Milford, Connecticut in 1639, and uh, were some of the founders of the town. And my mother uh, was born on, uh, in Martha's Vineyard, from uh, her mother was a Dan uh, and Nantucket, and uh, her father was uh, Martha's Vineyard. You pretty well qualify as a Yankee. To <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> Sandy, tell us about uh, when and where you entered the military. Well, uh, I uh, thought I would like to get in the Navy, and uh, uh, they turned me down because I didn't have the proper number of matching molars. Molars? Teeth. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, the Army was delighted to get me. They <laughs> said, you don't have to chew too much here. <laughs> well, tell us about entering the service. In September of 42, there was a war on, uh -huh. uh, had been for almost yeah. a year. I enlisted. Uh -huh. um, tell us about the process of enlisting. Where did you go? And, uh, well, uh, I think I uh, entered a, was sent primarily to a uh, uh, enlistment center in Boston. And then uh, when uh, they called me up, I was sent to Fort Devens and stayed there just three or four days. And they decided you belong down to Fort Monmouth. Okay. If, at that particular time, uh, the Navy didn't want you because of molars. Did you try any of the other branches, the Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Air Corps? No, Corps? I didn't. Uh, so you went into the Army in September of 42, and they sent you f uh, for, uh, to Fort Monmouth? That's right. Uh -huh. Right after basic? Or you hadn't even had basic no, I had basic uh, Camp Edison, which was connected with Fort Monmouth. Okay. I How, spent, uh, entered, uh, was received at uh, Fort Devens. Reception center. And, but after that, you went into basic training. That's right. Definitely. Tell us about that. What was that like? Well, it was a bit primitive down there. And uh, course that was the first time I lived in a tent with five other guys. <laughs> but we got along fine. Mm -hmm. When you entered the service, uh, did friends or family join the military when you did, or were you no, all they on your own? No, they didn't. But my wife oh, came my. down and uh, uh, we lived off the post after a while, and I got a nice little house in a little town in Oceanport. That's why you could be married 66 years then, because you married before you went into the oh, service. Yes. You got a, a leg up on a lot of other guys. You bet. Uh -huh. Tell us more about basic training, to go from a civilian life and the, the work you did uh, in the factory there. Uh, a uh, good deal of that involved uh, physical training, and uh, I was uh, always athletically inclined, so that didn't bother me too much. In fact, I rather enjoyed it. I had a corporal that, uh, that uh, was a training uh, non-com, and he got very upset with me because I could beat him at some, some of the things that he was trying to teach us. <laughs> Such as the long jump and things of that nature. Yeah. Did you, you, you took uh, basic infantry training? Well, I guess that's, I guess all, all uh, basic training is pretty much the same way. I think I read somewhere on your credentials here that you got a, uh, a medal f for an expert rifleman, is that correct? That's right. Uh -huh. Is this where you got it? Yes, at uh, Fort Monmouth. Uh, uh -huh. Tell us about that, that uh, to come out of there qualified with a rifle? Well, you, uh, I guess everybody that joins the military has to uh, uh, get familiarized with uh, 
various weapons which you may or may not ever have to use. So, uh, uh, of course, we had our daily field trips that ran anywhere up to 10 miles a day. And uh, then one day they said, well, you don't have to walk much today. We're going to take you down to Camp Edison for the rifle ranges and, uh, and see how you can fire. So uh, we went down there and uh, I was handed a Springfield 30-30 and the target area, I guess, was 300 yards. And uh, they said, see how many of those targets you could hit? Well, I, I did very, very well at it. I think uh, out of a possible 200 score, I had something like 185. Had you ever fired a rifle before? Oh, yes. Uh, a small one, a 22 caliber, perhaps. So you came with a little preparation. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I'd also fired uh, the, uh, the Colt uh, Sportsman's Pistol Automatic. And uh, in the Army, we had the same uh, frame with a 45 caliber on. And you had to fire that. And that's a bit of a surprise when you first fire a 45. <laughs> it hops up in the air. <laughs> I think the only guy that ever did that well was George Patton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> During uh, basic training, did you develop close friendships with any of the men you were Well, yes, with? I did. Two in particular, one of whom we still are very, very closely acquainted with. They now live in Missouri, but uh, my wife and his wife, well, he was married at the, while we were all together down at Fort Monmouth. And he went to officer's training school, and I didn't want to do that because I, uh, OCS, because I had my wife down there, and I was very happy to live as close to a normal life if, as possible. So I chose not to go to OCS. And I, so then they had me uh, as a instructor in the enlisted men's school, and we had I had uh, students all the way from uh, privates up to up to majors, and some of them from other countries. You had an students. important decision there that you made, though, not to become an officer. Did you ever look back and think your career in the army might have been totally different? It sure would have been. Yeah. Did you ever regret that decision? Not until it came time to. Uh, get uh, discharged. No, I don't think I regretted that. I, I really enjoyed uh, teaching and I enjoyed having the chance to live with my wife off the post. Mm -hmm. There's a, a decision that was made in here by somebody who looked at you and your skills and talents and from infantry training, uh, you just told me a second ago that you went on to teaching Tell us about that transition. How did that come about? Well, uh, you, uh, uh, after you finished basic training, they sent me up to Fort Monmouth where they uh, reviewed my uh, qualifications. They said, well, somebody that's had uh, this experience in the communications field had better stick around here and we can use you as an instructor. So they did. And I was there for two years teaching the uh, principle of electricity. And one of my buddies that I mentioned out in Missouri uh, was teaching in the same building I was. That's how we got so well acquainted. Tell us about this facility where you were teaching. Who went to it? Well, they were basically uh, people with communications experience that had very little formal education. And uh, so they were washing out guys uh, that should be out in the field uh, as linemen or, uh, or telephone repairmen because they couldn't pass uh, simple things like uh, basic arithmetic and uh, principles of electricity and that sort of thing. So they, they lost an awful lot of good men that way and then they decided that what they had to do was to run a school that would teach them those basics and, and use them where they belonged. So that school had not existed up to the point you came along? Well, uh, it, I guess they had a, a training system there, but it didn't, wasn't as formally organized as, I, as it was when I got there. What was this particular facility called? Was it a, 
a school or an electronics well, school? Was a, electricity they they school? call it the uh, uh, enlisted men's school, but we had officers as students too. And you said you had people from other countries? Yes, I had uh, a major they? from Brazil, for example, and uh, then we had uh, several Canadian officers, lieutenants and captains and the likes. Without getting too detailed for my lack of technical ability, but tell us what you taught them. Well, I mean, Tell us what you taught these people. Uh, well, I'd say basic principles of electricity, both alternating and direct current. And uh, we would have, uh, oh, very simple arithmetic. And I al we also were uh, made to uh, develop training aids, which we did. And uh, for demonstrations, we had some ra rather primitive uh, uh, examples of, well, for example, of a series circuit why we'd uh, talk, refer, compare that to a, a bunch of elephants uh, with a, following the elephant in front with a tail with a trunk, and they're all strung out in a row, and that would be a series circuit. And then, uh, for example, I, I wanted to know about parallel circuits, and that was a little different. Well, I compared that with a, a barrel of water. And uh, so, uh, as you, uh, drill a hole in the bottom of the barrel, water starts to leak out, and that compares to one electric light bulb on one circuit. And then uh, uh, you keep drilling more holes, and uh, you keep putting more bulbs on the same circuit. And then to find a, a short circuit, you knock the bottom out of the barrel. <laughs> so I'd, uh, I'd give them uh, little stories like that, and it kind of helps a lot to make them uh, understand what you're talking about. How long was the course that you taught? Oh, I'd say Months. that each individual spent six weeks there. Six weeks. But I, I was, I'd get a new group probably every six weeks. And did the school grow while you were there? The Army found it needed more and more of these oh, people yeah. equipped this way? Especially when uh, such things as radar were, were invented. Uh, the, the fellows that got in to uh, radio and uh, wireless communication had a different cup of tea than the fellows that were uh, the likes of me that were in, in wired systems. Do you mind? Have a drink. <laughs> You're okay? All right. <coughs> About how many men were going through your school or, or your particular segment of it in this six-week interval? Well, each one of my classes, I would have probably anywhere from 15 to 30 or 35 men. And at any point, did you do uh, anything else? Did you go back to infantry training in any way or be caught up on that segment no, of your No, except military? for... Uh, uh, you do have to uh, maintain your, your physical condition, and they figured that a good way to do that was take you on frequent hikes <laughs> and uh, teach you how to set up your, you know, your uh, bivouac with uh, pup tents and the likes of that. This is in South Jersey, isn't it? Uh, uh, Central Jersey. Central Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the climate like, and uh, where where did you go out tempting and camping? Well, that would be right uh, in the vicinity of uh, uh, Belmar, New Jersey, I'd say, and Long Branch. I'd say that I spent more time in the vicinity of Long Branch and that sort of thing than anywhere else, which was right outside of Fort Monmouth. <clears throat> According to the Army, it's within walking distance. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice for you, that the, the Jersey Shore, to be down there and see that. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, this, I've, I think I've got you now up until 1943, uh, your classes in mm -hmm. six-week increments. Um, 
was the rest of 43 about the same that these classes would come and go and come and go? Oh yeah, and uh, continue on through 1934, uh, 44. No, no, 20. Well, wait a minute. Well, you you, you started in September yeah. of 42, so mm -hmm. you're up into 43, and about the same thing is mm -hmm. happening. And uh, that continued on until New Year's of 45 when I shipped out. Okay. Well, we, we won't jump up there yet. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the war is still going on, both in, in Europe and mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. What were you hearing about that and uh, the, the needs of the Army for your particular skills? Well, uh, the Battle of the Bulge uh, started, I think, in, uh, toward the end of uh, 43 or 44. And uh, when uh, I was getting ready to they, they told me that I wasn't going to be there much longer, so they outfitted me with all heavy gear, Class A uniforms, overcoats, blankets, and then I go to the tropics. <laughs> well, we've heard that one before, yeah. people in the wrong clothing. That anticipates a question I might have asked you. Um, when it came to the point where it, it, it was obvious that the Army was going to move you somewhere around the end of 44 mm -hmm. uh, and into 45, did they ever talk to you about the cultural differences um, that you might be facing in another No, place? they gave me no indication whatever where I was going. I didn't know. I thought it was most likely to be in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I wound up in the South Pacific. Considering the clothing they gave you, you would almost bet that they were going to send you to Europe. Right. So right. did they talk to you about going to Europe? No. Did they talk to they you about going to any They didn't give us any indication place. whatever where, we'd, yeah. be, where we'd, be, we'd be going. In fact, we were actually on the way before I, I, I saw a copy of the orders. All right. At the end of 1944, um, let's say New Year's Eve, this is, it's going to be 1945. Yeah, okay. um, tell us how you got the news. and that you knew you were going to leave New Jersey? Well, they called me and uh, actually there were 14 enlisted men and six officers in the mission that uh, they said you're going to have a, going on a mission but they didn't say where. And actually got in on a plane, uh, we shipped out on uh, B-24s that were being, uh, new, new ones were being shipped over to the uh, combat areas. So we were passengers on the B-24s and uh, they said, well, your mission is going to be eventually to reestablish communications in Manila. All right, where did you fly out of? Uh, Hamilton Field, California. And oh, from uh, New, Jer New Jersey out to the coast. How did you get out to the coast? Oh, we uh, uh, went down to the railroad station and uh, the station was in Red Bank, and they uh, uh, gave us Pullman cars that were made out of old box cars. <laughs> and uh, so the 14 of, uh, men in, in my group, the enlisted men, and the, and the six officers were all in one car together. And we had, oh yeah, we shipped out on New Year's Day, and did you ever hear of being redlined? Well, Only in banking terms. Uh, being redlined means that you don't get paid that day. So uh, when we got on the train, the 14 of us had but between the bunch of us 50 bucks. <laughs> and all the way across the country, that just circulated back and forth in poker games. <laughs> <laughs> what was your rank at this time? I was a corporal then. A corporal? And I, I made a sergeant after I got to Manila. Were you uh, typical of the other enlisted men? Were they uh, rated accordingly? Uh, anywhere from PFCs up to uh, tech sergeants. Mm -hmm. And what's, what was the highest officer with you? First lieutenant. First lieutenant mm -hmm. in charge of this group going across yeah, country mm -hmm. with 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get across the country? Well, we spent about three days doing that and uh, we wound up in San Francisco and had a uh, 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 three days of time and no money to have fun with. So this 
first lieutenant, he was a real operator. He finagled us a, a supplementary payday. So we, we all got some pay and had a three-day pass off at San Francisco and had a hell of a good time out of it. Had you ever been west? Uh, well, you'd been to Ohio, of course, but had you been out to the west coast before? No. But actually, when you live in Ohio, we, we felt that we, we lived in the east. <laughs> Okay, that's a, a relative thought. Yeah. And you got three days in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and you got paid, and yeah. now you're uh, picking up a B-24. And that was over at uh, what is now Megar Air Force Base at that time. It was Fairfield Suisan Air Base. And uh, so we stayed there oh, it was nearly two weeks before we got uh, on a kind of priorities with higher ranking officers and uh, non-coms, we had to spend about two weeks before we, our number came up to go out. Would you say this was approximately January of 45? That's right. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, we went from there to, to uh, let me see, uh, the first stop of course was uh, Hickam Field. Mm -hmm. Right outside of Honolulu. Right. Uh, and uh, we arrived there. And a, and a uh, primitive airplane, as far as passengers were concerned. You sat on wooden, wooden benches along the side, and you had your overcoat on and, uh, and covered up with a blanket because we were flying pretty high, as high as you could go without oxygen. And then uh, we landed at uh, Hickam Field about, uh, I'd say, 5.30 in the afternoon and time to have dinner. I'm an authority on Hawaii. I've been there for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get back to this airplane ride because what you've just said is interesting. That is not typically the inside of a B-24. Did they convert them to carry you folks over these no, More benches? or less, yes. Uh -huh. Did they close in the gun windows uh, on this flight? Yeah. Uh -huh. So you didn't actually freeze to death where you might have? There were no, no uh, active guns on board. And how many men did, did your whole group go over in 24s? Well, uh, my, uh, me and I think uh, six of them, my group in that one flight, and the rest of them were okay, a day or two later. So, so six And we wound up down in uh, Nads Ave, New Guinea. All right, two hours in Hawaii, and yes. you took off again in 24s again? That's right. Same plane I was on the same plane all the way. Okay. And the next stop was Canton Island, which is right just about on the equator. And then uh, the next day, uh, we took off and uh, I arrived at Guadalcanal at noon. And then uh, that night we took off and uh, landed at Biak, right on the north coast of New Guinea. Did you have any better luck at Guadalcanal? Did you, how many hours were you there? Oh, <laughs> I would say that uh, I had bad luck there because I was still in a Class A uniform and an overcoat. And when we opened the door at Guadalcanal at noon, it was like step, stepping into a blast furnace. <laughs> so you landed at Henderson Field, is that correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, the next morning, we stayed there overnight, and uh, the next morning we took off and uh, landed at Biak. It's, that was a long flight. Must have been about three o'clock in the afternoon when we got to Biak. At any point along the way, or let's ask it this way, at what point along the way did you know where you were ultimately going to land, your, your destination? Oh yeah, we had... Uh, uh, the Lieutenant Buchanan uh, read our orders uh, uh, just before we got to Honolulu. And uh, then uh, that's, that's the first time we knew where we would wind up. Was Biak your ultimate destination? No, uh, Manila was the ultimate destination. Okay. Had you uh, ever known of any of these places along the way? Had you ever heard of them? Not beyond the Hawaiian Islands, I'd never heard of Canton Island or, well, I'd heard of Guadalcanal on account of the 
the battles, battles that were there. Yeah. But I didn't know anything about it. And the same thing applied to uh, New Guinea. Uh, we were at uh, Nadzab, New Guinea, is uh, in between in a valley between the Owen Stanley Mountains, and it's a magnificent country, a beautiful place. And we had a nice uh, river that came down there, which they had, previous people had built a bit of a dam and made a nice swimming hole out of it. We had a good place to swim, and uh, the only problem there was bugs. All through uh, the tropics, uh, wherever I went, the biggest bugaboo was bugs. <laughs> <laughs> when did you ultimately get rid of your overcoat? And well, I had a heck of a time England getting clothes. rid of it. Uh, I didn't get rid of that until I'd been down in New Guinea for uh, three or four weeks. Nobody would take it. None of the supply fly officers would. They had no use for overcoats down there. So it was a tough time getting rid of it. When did you finally get tropical clothes? Oh, I would say, uh, well, of course, we had suntan uniforms uh, all the way through from the, from the first time you, uh, uh, when we first got to Port Monmouth. And you, you had Class A uniforms, of course, which were wool and an overcoat, and then you had suntans, and as soon as the weather warmed up, I, you'd uh, hear the announcement over the PA system, uniform of the day, suntans. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a welcome change. You, you got to Manila. Yeah, and, and I got rid of all my uh, heavy clothes and two or three more sets of suntan uniforms. Can you give us an approximate date of, of your arrival at Manila? At Manila? I got to Manila, Manila on Washington's birthday, uh, February 22nd. Of 1945. That's right. <laughs> and the war, as we know now, in the Pacific wasn't going to be over for another six months or so. Mm -hmm. uh, can you describe Manila in February well, of 1945? Uh, we were free to roam around. Uh, my first job there was to install a small switchboard in the Far East University. And then you were free to roam around the city or wherever you wanted, as long as you got back someplace to eat. <laughs> now, the city had been liberated. Um, uh, yeah, but it was a, a total disaster area. That's what I'd like you to tell us about. Uh, you saw something that so many other people would love to hear about. Describe Manila. At well, times. most all of the uh, uh, downtown area was all devastated, uh, complete, completely blown apart, and at times you even saw uh, fragments of, of bodies like an arm sticking out of a bunch of rubble. And uh, my next job there was I installed a big switchboard, six position what they call uh, multiple switchboard, uh, which is pretty much like a, what was in existence here. Mm -hmm. And those switchboards that, that I installed at the, at the Manila Customs House were made where, where I used to work in Watertown. And, uh, and the people had signed their names in there that, <laughs> that I knew. Is that right? Yeah. That was worked on the boards. Was there any fighting still going on, on on this island at this time, or had they moved on? Well, uh, uh, when we uh, got outside of the city and, and camped out there, there was a mountain range maybe eight or ten miles to the east of where we were, and you could see uh, flamethrowers uh, all night long going on here and there, because I guess the Japs had found a bunch of caves out there and, and shelters. And it used to make my skin crawl to think of standing in front of those flamethrowers. <laughs> could you hear any of this or any of the uh, battle oh, sounds? You could hear uh, gunfire, yes. Did you get close to it at any particular time? No, but one night uh, uh, while I was uh, installing the uh, 
the big switchboard in the Cousins house. I was living in on Pier, Pier 7 in Manila. And uh, so uh, when I'd get through, it would be dark. And if you uh, stroll along with a flashlight, the Japs would shoot at you, snipe at you. And if you didn't have that, and, uh, and you, any of our own men saw motion, they were likely to fire in your direction. Well, I had the first experience I've had was a sniper uh, hit a brick wall right beside my head. And that was very frightening because it made one heck of a noise and I got scattered with fragments of bricks. And why, then, why were you out at night with a flashlight? Is this I, part of your work? I worked that late. Yeah. yeah. And uh, get back to uh, where I'd uh, go bumping up for the night. And uh, there'd be uh, hundreds of men sleeping in this huge warehouse on top of the, the dock there. And uh, there would be guards walking around with uh, 22 caliber rifles taking pot shots at various and sundry rats which were inhabiting the place. In this big warehouse full of guys, uh, were they also the men you had come over with or had flown over with? Were you part of that uh, same No, they unit? were uh, a lot more men than that. But were they included in that group, the fellows well, the six, you had come over the, with? The other five fellows that came over with me were, yeah. Yeah. What unit were you in now? What was the name or number of your unit? Well, I left uh, Fort Bonneville as part of Company A and the uh, 15th Signal Service Regiment. And then uh, some of the other fellows were either in that uh, regiment or the 803rd Signal Service Regiment which was also based at, based at Fort Monmouth. You were in a war zone uh, at this particular time. Mm, yeah. uh, it's an odd question to ask you, but did any of these organizations come out, the USO groups come out to uh, entertain you as units? Did oh you yeah, see any of them? Uh, Irving Berlin was there in person with This Is The Army, and that was in New Guinea. And then uh, up in the Manila area, there was a USO unit with Oklahoma. And that was a very fine production. Did you see these yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's great. Can you tell me where was Douglas MacArthur at this time? Was he at Manila? Is well, he uh, had, uh, was still in Corregidor, but he moved into, the, into Manila in the uh, city hall where he made his headquarters. Was, had Corregidor been liberated at this time? Yeah, just about. Uh -huh. In fact, we had a, uh, a field trip out there on, uh, on a, on a uh, transportation corps boat one day. And we had a, uh, a trip all through the, uh, the, the caves and the underground uh, places where it was full of uh, bones and didn't smell very good. <laughs> This is 45. Um, right, huh? You, got, you, got, you sailed across the harbor to get there. Right, huh? Tell us about Corregidor, what you saw. Well, it was a, a lot bigger island than I was expecting. Uh, and uh, they had uh, a number of tunnels and caves that had been in there probably before the war. And that's where the Japanese uh, when they were inhabiting uh, the Philippines, they, they made a lot of their headquarters in there. And that's where they got scorched out with flamethrowers, fortunately, before I got there. <laughs> These dead that you saw, you, you assume now are, were Japanese? Yeah, on Corregidor they were. Are, is there any remnants of what, did you, could see anything that the Americans had left behind? No, we uh, were pretty closely supervised and kept together in, a, in our group. And uh, I would say that the only evidence we saw that the Americans had been there was uh, rifle shells uh, that had been ejected from guns. Mm -hmm. 
mostly from M16s and 3030s. At any time uh, that you talked to other people, did you ever run into anybody who had been at either Corregidor or Bataan? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Can you tell us about that, please? Well, there was one fellow there that uh, told us quite a lot of detail. He was on a 50 mile march from uh, Manolo down to Bataan. And he said that that was one heck of a trip. And uh, they had quite a lot of fighting going on there at the, on the way and after they got there. And he had lost several buddies, but fortunately he hadn't been hit or hurt himself. Under what circumstances did you meet this man? Did you meet him at a, at a hospital or a transit center or something? No, he was... Uh, he was at a... He was also a signal car man. He was, at that time, working in the Manila Signal Office, which was the uh, headquarters of all the communications, Army communications around Manila at that, at that time. That's where they assigned us on the jobs that we were going to do. Mm -hmm. From where you were working, physically working, did you ever have occasion to see MacArthur go by or going in and out of his headquarters? Oh, I saw him once, I think. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, they uh, said, now you guys are going to go where you might run into General MacArthur, and if you do, act like soldiers. <laughs> or else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you see anything that moves, salute it. <laughs> right. If it doesn't move, paint it. <laughs> Specifically, while you were in Manila, what was your job? Now, you, you've talked about assembling this, this switchboard, uh, but you were to set up communications across the city, or what? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. I, uh, I, was, I, I would say at the Manila Signal Office at the Customs House, I had be careful of your five... Mic there. Uh, uh, Sandy, be careful of uh, your yeah. mic. Thank I you. I had five, at least had been working with me, and I was a supervisor, and two or three uh, uh, Filipinos that, that did the, the heavy work, dirty work. With the overall objective of what? Of uh, see, getting as many lines out to various uh, groups around the city, and uh, into uh, we even had lines into the MacArthur's headquarters. But uh, he had a group over there that took care of their end of it, and we just took care of our end of it, and. Uh, Later on, after I got out to the Engineer Construction Command, and my uh, central office was a terminal point for cables from uh, downtown Manila uh, to, uh, we had a test point that we had to check in every night with to connect between uh, downtown Manila and Nichols, Nichols Field and uh, Lingayen Gulf and all over the island of Luzon. So, Either me or my central office maintenance man had to spend alternate nights there manning that test point. So they would tell us uh, what lines to short out so they could test the quality of communication, let's say, between downtown and, and Nichols Field or, or Nielsen Field. As you were Moving around Manila, did your work ever take you into areas, you spoke a moment ago about being fired at by a sniper. Mm -hmm. Were you fired at again at, at other times? Yes, we had, uh, and, uh, we had lines that ran across the rice paddy from my ex telephone exchange to Nichols Field. And almost every night, uh, some Japs would come down there and cut those lines. So. Uh, we kept on repairing them every day, even though we ran a, an alternate line on a completely different route that they didn't know about. So uh, every morning, my uh, 
one of my men would go out and find out where it was cut, that we'd go out and, and repair it. And uh, this one morning, uh, I was about six feet behind uh, the other one of my men, and, and uh, a uh, bullet uh, kicked up the dust right between us. And that was a little disconcerting, and, and we never could actually see the, the fat guy that shot at us, but we assumed that he was in a, uh, one of the trees, which is on the other side of the, uh, maybe a quarter of a mile away. And they either had uh, bum uh, weapons or not very good uh, sharpshooters. You felt he should have hit you, right? And I was glad that, <laughs> that they were very bum shots. Were you armed at the time? Did you carry a carbine or some other weapon? No, I had I had one, but I never never took it with me out like that. What defense did you have if you were attacked? Feet. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, pretty. Yeah, you turn around, and run like hell. That's pretty <laughs> basic. <laughs> we called them TUs, transportation units. <laughs> Were you offered any protection when you went out into these areas? Did the, uh, your no, lieutenant say, take no. along a couple of shots? Yes, it's perfectly safe, no problem. Right. The only thing is that uh, they didn't tell the Japs that. <laughs> uh -huh. We're getting up into 45 here, uh, past January, February, and Luzon is going to be secured eventually. Did you ever begin to get the feeling that you were going to be part of the invasion of Japan? Yes. Uh -huh. what, did, what did they tell you about that? Well, I was instructed to build a, a mobile uh, telephone office on a six by six truck, which we did. And the idea was, oh yeah, I had uh, uh, 50 pair cables connected to these two switchboards that I had on the truck. And the idea was that when they landed probably at Kyosho, uh, that somebody would run ashore with one end of the cable and, and uh, go as far as the, the cable would let them, and then they'd put, uh, mount a terminal, terminal box on a tree or someplace. And uh, uh, later on, anybody happened to have a uh, telephone, could hitch onto those uh, terminal boxes. And uh, then they were in business so they could make phone calls through our, our switchboard to anybody else that was connected to that board or any other switchboard that we had contact with. Theoretically, <laughs> where were you and your switchboard supposed to be? On well, the we, were, we were in a, a building, I hate to tell you this, it was the Whack Whack Country Club. When they told us we were going out to, told me I, you're going out to a country club the next job, I said, I've heard that stuff before. <laughs> but it was. So uh, I had a, uh, a big room in there for, the, for our central office switchboard equipment. And uh, that's about as far as that went. And they had cables uh, terminated in there on this uh, test panel. I think I've missed a beat here. When somebody went ashore with the cable, put the box up on the tree to hook a phone up to. They never got that far because we never made that invasion. Okay, but where were you supposed to be then with your switchboard? I would be on the truck with the, uh, where the switchboards were. And, but you would be ashore. Yeah. You would have invaded the Japanese uh, right, islands. Yeah. Fortunately, it didn't happen. Yeah, fortunately. Uh, I, my notes tell me that you uh, were Excuse awarded me. a Bronze Star. Right. Uh, uh -huh. Can you tell us what that was for? Well, I would say that it was for, uh, they call it for activity against the enemy. Well, I, I didn't do anything against the enemy. They did it against me. Uh, but my job was to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, communications were secure. And I used to have to make uh, field trips. I was uh, given a, a Jeep, good old number 26, <laughs> and uh, 
I would go from uh, location to location and, and examine uh, what their facilities were for contacting people in and out, mm -hmm. out to our board, for example, and in f from another one someplace else. And eventually we had a chain of command from the Manila S uh, Signal Office all the way through a group of local switchboards, of which mine was one, all the way out to Nichols Field and then Guyan Gulf. I'd like to ask you if um, a, a, a rather personal question, when the possibility lay in your life that you would invade the Japanese home islands, can you tell us how you felt about that? What were your feelings as a, as well, a human being? I figured if we were going to have to do it, that we would uh, be well protected, and I wanted to be part of it. And I was just as happy that it didn't happen, but uh, I did expect it was, would happen at the time. But uh, we had Japanese prisoners around there that we had assigned dirty jobs like cleaning latrines and, and split trenches and that sort of thing. And uh, I would uh, I'd talk to several Japs that spoke English and they thought that they were in California. Did they really? Yeah, that guy did, and I guess most of the rest of them. And they were sure that the Japanese were winning the war. Did you uh, tell them that the possibility existed that they were not winning the war? Oh, yeah. They, they, they thought we were a bunch of liars. <laughs> yeah. Before you went over, I asked you before, did the Army prepare you at all for meeting another cultural uh, life beyond uh, New Jersey. What was your impression of meeting the Japanese and meeting the Filipinos and uh, uh, being in Asia? Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, uh, Filipinos uh, were quite interesting because the majority of the adults could speak English after a fashion. And I never made any attempt to learn uh, Tagalog, which is their local language. And uh, I wish I had, because I would have learned, learned a lot more about their place than I did know. But we, uh, our, our general, General Svodrup, he was quite an operator. He commandeered a, a big, uh, I'd say you'd almost call it a mansion that belonged to a wealthy Japanese, uh, uh, Filipino family before, and then the Japs occupied it when they were there. But he turned that over to us for an enlisted men's club. And we had a dandy. In fact, uh, uh, some of the high-ranking officers from downtown Manila uh, made a visit out there and tried to take it away from us. Well, uh, the first sergeant uh, uh, went to General Svodrup about that and told him that they were going to take our club away from us, and he says, oh, that's so. So he's a major general. So he came down, and he it was very handy at booting out the likes of chicken colonels <laughs> or uh, light colonels or majors or anybody else that thought they were going get, to get away with that. So they never did. We, we hung on to our, our club, and we had a dandy. We had some Japanese, some Chinese, uh, not Japanese, uh, Filipino experts with bamboo and we had a bar room in there that, that he had uh, that these uh, Filipino bamboo experts had covered the wall with. It was a beautiful place. The only thing was it wasn't very good liquor. <laughs> it wasn't very good looking? No. Uh, I suppose you could bear with that, couldn't you? Yeah. Well, of course, we had uh, issued beer. That was all right, but uh, if you wanted a a highball, you had some uh, ersatz whiskey and uh, and about all I had to put with it was all right with me and that was water. But the, uh, the uh, so-called whiskey was terrible. Did you, uh, you or your men make your own whiskey? Not there, but they did down in New Guinea. Oh, there's another thing. Uh, we have, I, uh, 
I was in a tent with the other five fellows that came over with me and a crew of a, uh, of a B-24 bomber. There were uh, six of them, uh, there was about 11 or 12 of us in this big tent. And about every afternoon they'd have to go up for a training mission and they, they'd take uh, one of our cases of beer up along with them and, and for 500 gallons of gas they'd cool the beer. <laughs> You had no ice, so you'd take it up to 15,000 feet. No. <laughs> <laughs> a, I don't want to. came back, we had a nice cold beer. Oh, that's very kind of them to do that. Yeah. I, I don't want to go backward here, but uh, you were in wartime Manila. Was it, did you have blackouts at night? Yeah. And were, were you under, did they bomb you at any time during that time? Not there. I, but the, I, I had a stop over at Lady on the way up, mm -hmm. and I hadn't been on the ground for 15 minutes before we had a, a Jap raid there, and we all hit the deck. <laughs> Tell and us I, about that. How many planes do you know? How many were involved? Well, I'd say two. And they bombed you, and you felt someone was trying to they kill you? They bombed the, uh, the airstrip, Yeah. and we were right beside the airstrip, but nothing, nothing hurt us at all. But after they uh, gave the all clear, we got up and made out of there. And there was a big uh, muddy bank that I slid down with all my gear, a barracks bag and <laughs> everything I owned. And I landed down at the bottom of that thing and the remarks I made were not fit to print. <laughs> Something about have a nice day, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the next morning, uh, and come out of a tent and we had the most primitive uh, toilet facilities that you could imagine. You had to sit on a board and there you are stark naked and a couple of Filipino women come along and say, you got any laundry? <laughs> That's very disconcerting when you're under those conditions. Were you, were you in Manila when the war ended? Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us about that. The war is over. Tell us about that well, night. Uh, we had a truckload of characters that invited me along and we went downtown where there was some decent uh, refreshment. And uh, I don't remember getting back to my tent that night, but I was there the next morning. <laughs> about what month was that then? That was in... Uh, when the war ended? Yeah, that, that was, was I'd August. Say, uh, about uh, October. October? Mm -hmm. All righty. No, um, the, the actual... Uh, I think it... The date was early in August. Yeah, about the 10th yeah. of August, something were in there. That's when they dropped the bomb. And then we, we knew then that it wasn't going to be much longer, but uh, we didn't get out of there right away. How, uh, you were on the point system then. Did you come home on rotation that way? Well, I got home on my age. I was over 35. And that's the end of 45 and you're coming home. Yeah. How did you get home? Well, uh, uh, I came home on a, on a uh, C2 cargo vessel, which was, uh, they call it, uh, I think they had a name of it, the, the Santa Cruz. And it was operated by uh, uh, the American President Line, which went out of business about then. But they were under franchise, I guess, to, to run uh, some of this ocean service. And so I, we left Manila 12 hours ahead of a typhoon, and that chased us for three days. And I am not a good sailor. I, I heat up everything I had for a while, oh. weeks, and uh, yeah, I've never gotten air sick, but uh, I sure am a, a bum sailor. Did you could stop any place on the way home? Yeah, we uh, we stopped at uh, no, just Honolulu, I guess, was the only place that we stopped, and uh, we were told we were going to uh, go to San Francisco. Well, the day before, in fact, we got in sight of, the, of the, the mainland and they turned the ship south 
Hey, where, where the heck are you going? Well, we've been diverted to San Pedro, which is mm -hmm. the port of Los Angeles. So well, you miss going under the Golden Gate. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you're almost home. You're in San Pedro, California. So I took my discharge at Camp Beale. Spell and that, please. Camp Beale, California. Beale, all right. And uh, uh, among other things, I gave you $300 to get home on. And my wife uh, was still, uh, she, she worked for the Signal Corps office in uh, part of Fort Monmouth, too, in, uh, uh, Eatontown, New Jersey, and I was expecting maybe she, she had, oh yeah, I had uh, rescued my old car, which was a 1938 Chevy that I had left up in uh, Maine when I went in the service, and I had no tires. Well, on a, I had a furlough and got up there, and, uh, and a, uh, a friend who was an operator, quite an operator, managed to promote a set of, of uh, retread tires for it. So I took that down to Fort Monmouth and, and I had a funny idea that Mary was going to drive out to the West Coast and meet me there. <laughs> no way. But she did uh, get some people, uh, another couple to ride with her down as far as New Orleans. And so well, we did get enough communication to know that that's where she was going to be. So. I, I, I got transportation by rail to, to New Orleans from Los Angeles. Let's stop just there for a minute because there's something I, I should like to look back on. You were married before you came into the service mm -hmm. and Mary's waiting for you back in New Jersey. Yeah. Tell us about being married and the war intervening in, in totally in your lives and you're half a world away. How did you communicate? Well, we had a lot of uh, letters back and forth, of course, that passed through censors. And how but did you sneak through the censorship? How, did you have a code? Well, there was one thing. We had a friend up in Maine that uh, was a, a retired Standard Oil Company man, and he had been formerly in charge of all the Standard Oil operations in the Far East and headquartered in Manila. And so, uh, I thought I was going to tip her off as to where I was. I said, Joe Maddox would have liked it here. <laughs> and she never did uh, connect that up with, with Manila. But if she'd spoken to him, I guess she, we lost contact with them before that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if he knew that uh, I was some place where he would be familiar with, well, then he'd say, I know where that guy is. He's in Manila. <laughs> But she never connected that up. Did you uh, otherwise have a lot of letters home and a lot of letters from Mary? Yeah, and uh, I'd been home for two months and a box of cookies arrived that she had sent to me overseas. <laughs> and they were still edible, although they were pretty well battered up. Did Mary save your letters? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you look at them today? I, I've, I've got to stack them uh, over at home now. Uh -huh. A couple of boxes of them. You, you are reunited with Mary in New Orleans, and it's uh, mm -hmm. getting, you're about to be discharged, or you have been? I had already been discharged. Yeah. And do you, did you drive home in your 38 Chevy? Yep, uh -huh. and we picked up a hitchhiker, uh, another GI, uh, in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and he went all the way up to New York City with us. And he's quite a character. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with him. You had quite a career, and you saw a lot of places and met a lot of people. Can you find one most memorable experience of your time in the military? Well, uh, my most memorable experience was the, the children uh, over in Manila. Uh, every night uh, after chow, we'd take our mess kits out and uh, any uh, surplus stuff we had was one of the garbage cans and uh, then you had to wash out your mess kits. Well, these children would be there with 
most of them would have fruit juice cans and they'd take all that garbage and uh, they'd take that home with them and that's what their families were living on. Every night I'd reach, so adopt a, a child that we liked yourself and uh, uh, they'd be about four or five, six years old and then some of the bigger boys, it would be maybe nine or ten, would try to elbow them out of the way and, and collect the food. Well, we wouldn't let that happen. We'd say, you get out of here, or we'll, we'll fix your wagon. <laughs> so we, we saw to it that the small children got what they were after first. But that was very upsetting to think that the way people live here in this country and they had to survive over there on garbage that would ordinarily be thrown in a garbage can. Was there in your life at that time somebody you remembered as the most memorable character? Some one person that stands out? You mean a native or? Either one. Uh -huh. Some character that uh, you have met through the military service. Well, my, we still, our best friends today live in uh, uh, I worked with him in, in Fort Monmouth, he was one of the teachers at the same school that I was in. And then I ran into him over in Manila. He arrived over there as a second lieutenant. He did go to OCS. And uh, my wife and his wife are still extremely good friends. And uh, we uh, call each other on the phone every week or two. And uh, we communicate by mail. And if I had a computer, I'd be bombarded with email. Well, we don't have one, <laughs> but he does, and I guess... Your time will come. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's I half don't a century so. of friendship. That's nice to think yeah. about. And then I had another buddy who was quite an artist. And uh, he lived up on Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Uh, it was Ray Thompson. And... Uh, we uh, dropped in and saw them one time, he and his wife, uh, after I got back to civilization. And uh, we had a very nice reunion, and for about uh, two or three months after that, he dropped dead. Mm. And I have, up to this point, been very lucky. I had uh, the cane, I had a, a stroke three or four years ago, and I have recovered from that very well, but I still don't drive. But uh, we do have a very good uh, relationship with these friends. That's nice to know. Sandy, did you join any reserves, military reserves? When no, you I didn't join the reserves. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, I belong to the uh, uh, American Legion, uh, the, the uh, Massachusetts Post, the holding company, and I've been suggesting several times that I'd like to transfer to the Natick uh, Post out here, but nothing has ever developed out of that, and I still want to do that. Mm -hmm. Be careful of your microphone there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Beg pardon. So you are a member of the, the uh, veterans uh, right yeah, now? Yeah, but not an active one. Okay, but you, you I would like join, to get it yeah. in a local, local chapter. Can you look back quite a way now and tell us about what your feelings were as coming home? You're home, you're out of the military. Did you go back into the job you had before? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, but I'd say my feelings were utter, utter elation. <laughs> and I went back to uh, about 50 cents an hour more uh, as an hourly rated man more than when I left it, I thought I was in clover. And then, uh, of course, with my military experience as a wire chief and background, I became a, what they call a methods engineer. And I was responsible for repair methods on telephone equipment and uh, when a new product would be developed by Bell Laboratories and manufactured at one of our Western Electric uh, plants, which were scattered around the country, I would be shipped out to the, that plant to study that product and uh, divide, then come back and devise repair methods to uh, 
and teach it to the, uh, I would <laughs> so would refer to them as enlisted men, but anyway, the uh, lower graded uh, employees. And uh, I would make uh, test circuits and test sets for new products. And I frequently had uh, test equipment out that I had designed and made long before the headquarters came out with official test equipment. Now there's another thing. Uh, you're a bell system man, weren't you? Bob? No, I, I, I said I was before the Oh, you were, bells. yeah. Well, you know what a multiple switchboard is. Yes. Well, I was the first person in the, any of that area around there that that uh, tied in with party lines on, on, on the switchboard. So I uh, had WJRNM. <laughs> See, I, I, my uh, group there wanted more lines than, than I could provide, and I couldn't get another switchboard to, to make it up. So I had to make party lines. Everybody had a party line except the general. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Sandy, how important to you was serving in the military? Well, I, uh, I cursed it a lot while I was in it, but to, be, to this day I am uh, very glad I had that experience. Can you tell us how it affected the rest of your life if it did? Well, I call my wife my chief executive officer. And uh, to that extent, uh, uh, there's a bit of regimentation. <laughs> and that's what I just liked about the service, uh, regimentation. What did you think then, and, and what do you think now, regarding the war you participated in? Well, at that time, uh, we fully expected that uh, Germany, at least, uh, would uh, sooner or later uh, bomb American cities. And I didn't approve of that. <laughs> and uh, I was glad to have a... I enlisted because I felt it was a duty. I didn't wait to be drafted, but uh, I did feel that that I belong in some sort of a organization of uh, to protect the country. You might call it patriotism. I don't know. I guess I, you might say that I am a patriotic guy. I feel that uh, this is a great country, and I'd like to keep it that way. Do you feel there was a, a difference in public opinion regarding veterans from your war, World War II, and those that served in Korea or Vietnam or other conflicts? Well, I think that uh, uh, we made out quite a lot better as we uh, World War II boys. And I think that the, uh, Vietnam in particular got the dirty end of the stick from uh, Mis uh, mis misapprehensions and misinterpretations of what their duties were. They apparently felt that uh, individual soldiers over there were on their own and, and had created atrocities and that sort of thing, but it was not the case. When you're in the military, you do what the boss says. So I think they got the dirty end of the, of the stick. But uh, we had uh, uh, equipment that uh, I was amazed at the quantity and the, way, and the way they could deliver such huge amounts of material so far away. And uh, when I saw what the Japanese tried to fight a war with, I, I thought, what nerve these birds have to take out of a country like the United States. There, there was a significant difference there. Did, did you uh, receive any veterans' benefits, such as 
hospitalizations, the, the GI Bill or insurance? Well, I uh, got a 5% loan on, on a mortgage. That's all, you know, all I had. The, the GI mortgage, is that it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there one thought or um, memory that you would like to leave with us today to share with your family or other people who will be watching this tape? Well, I would say that we should appreciate what we have and uh, understand that so many people in other parts of the world live very primitively and don't have the opportunities for uh, a decent living that we do. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you feel you'd like to comment on before we close here? Not that it occurs, occurs to me, no. Okay. It seems to me like you've covered the situation pretty well. And my wife told me, don't talk too doggone much. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, we thank you for coming in. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Well.